that scene uh, is one of the Harinam we had daily, uh, going down uh, Tottenham Court Road. And uh, actually, Harinam was the life of the temple in Bury Place. Uh, that was a very wonderful temple, very, uh, a very tight family. Actually, the, the father and mother were Gurudas and Shamuna, and they were really taking care of us in a very uh, personal way. These are the devotees arriving from a concert tour in Germany. And a group of devotees headed by Mukunda and Tamal went over there. And it looks like they're coming back to London for the Ratha Yatra. After our record, Hare Krishna Mantra record, was released in uh, Europe, it became very popular to the point where we had an agent who was booking us concert tours all over Europe, especially England, but in other countries too. And we became so famous that we would put on these concerts with thousands of people in the audience who would pay to come and chant Hare Krishna and see this famous group called Radha Krishna Temple. And they would line up for autographs after the concerts. We used to go out to George's house in Esher, just the six of us for Kirtan with George and his wife, and sometimes his friends would come over. On one occasion, George says, you know, we ought to make a record. One thing led to the other, and very quickly, George called us into the studio, and we did this Hare Krishna Mantra record. And I should also mention that Mukunda and Gurdas and I always knew that we would be doing this. So from the time we got to London, we began acquiring instruments and practicing. We were a pretty practiced group, so that by the time George discovered us, we already knew how to do this stuff pretty well. Uh, Jamuna with her voice and, and Makunda, he was the lead musician. He, he had everything uh, orchestrated. He played the harmonium, the drums, whatever was required. I acquired an S-Raj, which is an Indian instrument, a bowed instrument that sits in the lap. And you get that eerie violin type sound. So we were already kind of a group before we met George. We knew that when we met George that we must have some kind of a musical relationship. So we were already pretty well polished. And so when we went into the recording studio to do this record, we, we, we did it in about an hour. The record was in the can in an hour. Paul McCartney was uh, there and he did a lot of the mixing in the control booth. This was an exceptionally ecstatic Rathiatra. This is the first real formal Rathiatra we had in London. We had one in 1969 where I built a cart. There were only six original devotees plus a few English uh, devotees and the cart collapsed a hundred feet after it got started and Marble Arch caused one of the largest traffic jams in London history. And there was no one around to record that. This is really the first major Rathiatra in England, 1970. And there were so many devotees there from all over Europe they came, and from America even. One of the most ecstatic Rathiatras in London, ever. In Harinam, we went, I believe, three times on Harinam in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening until night to Piccadilly Circus. And when we were coming, it was to take a little prashadam or to, to see the Arctic and uh, to read Bhagavad Gita and uh, whatever scriptures we have. So we were fully absorbed. So it was really our meditation, this Harinam. We, we used to, to meditate on hearing and uh, chanting the, the holy name, trying not to be distracted from all, uh, all the crowd and, uh, and all the shop windows. And actually, we got so absorbed that everybody was feeling uh, full of bliss and, and joy. When we first joined, and Prabhupada saw us uh, dancing with our nylon uh, bright pink and blue saris, he was very kind. He said, oh, these uh, young girls, they are just flowers uh, blowing in the wind. 
At that time, I was maintained. Uh, my family was selling hippie bells and beads on Oxford Street, and the devotees used to pass by and hurry on. Uh, that was quite an interesting Harinam. Sometimes there used to be one devotee called Isha, and he was a French-Canadian. He used to play trumpet, and he used to wear um, a dhoti. It was a leopard skin pattern dhoti. It wasn't leopard skin, but, <laughs> but, you know, they were quite a funny crowd, and they used to go down Oxford Street chanting, and sometimes I, you know, I joined on once or twice. So finally then uh, the record came out, the Hare Krishna record, and that one I used to play all, all day long at my little apartment. And then we heard, well, the guru's coming. Prabhupada didn't disappoint us, he arrived on time. And then I attended the first lecture in Conway Hall. Actually, I didn't understand anything that Prabhupada was saying, really. I mean, a few little words I could get now and again. But I just sat there, you know, just drinking the vibration and the whole divine presence of his, of his being. And, uh, and so by the time the interval came, you know, I just went to speak with the devotees and said, okay, when, when I can join, just, <laughs> just enough to see Prabhupada. One time, by the time he'd opened his mouth and by the time he'd closed his mouth was enough for me. And around a week later, I moved into Tittenhurst Park. The devotees were living on John Lennon's estate at that time. And so I arrived there, I got out of the van and the first person I saw was Malati and uh, she said, Prabhupada's in the temple room, quick, quick, Prabhupada's in the temple room. So I ran down this path through the trees into the temple room and uh, I entered into the doorway and there I could see Srila Prabhupada and he was just blessing a newborn baby, I think it, it was the baby of Ishan. Ishan was holding out the baby to Prabhupada and Prabhupada placed his hand on the baby's head and then Srila Prabhupada got down from the Vyasasan and he walked towards the doorway and uh, I was just like getting up from paying my obeisances and Malati immediately said, you know, Prabhupada, you know, these people are coming to Krishna consciousness and I just looked up at Prabhupada and Prabhupada looked down at me and, you know, and he said, Hare Krishna and a big, big smile on his face and it was like at that time everything just went spinning. It was like, uh, it seemed that I've been traveling through so many universes and so many lifetimes and just to come to that point, you know, to see my spiritual master and spiritual father and pure devotee of the Lord stood before me just looking at me in this, this first meeting, you know, it was something really, really strong. And so then one week later I got initiated and it was um, during that initiation ceremony actually that I heard the four rules and regulations from the mouth of Sula Prabhupada himself for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but that was okay with me because I, I just was like magnetized and fixed on Prabhupada. And yes, Prabhupada, anything Prabhupada said was okay, so no problem. I mean, part of the satisfaction, of course, of uh, a Rathiatra like this in those early days was just the mere miracle of having pulled it off. Um, we really were just a handful of, of young people. Um, there was also a certain sense of um, fulfilling of a mission, a prophecy, and that Srila Prabhupada had told us that this was Lord Chaitanya's prediction. And the, the sense that we were a part of the fulfillment of that prediction was a very exciting thing. Especially back in these days when uh, Rathiatra was not an established annual event in every major city. This was a first. This was a very, very big accomplishment. Our Sankirtan uh, for Lord Jagannath and for the Rathiyatra festival was, as you can see, completely ecstatic. Jagannath was the center of our lives. They, Lord Jagannath came to us before Radha Landaneshwara came to us via Shamshundar. Shamshundar carved these beautiful deities. And they, like in San Francisco, were the center of, of all the devotees' lives. During Prashadam, we used to even speak about Lord Jagannath and Lord Jagannath Subhadra and Balaram's beauty. And we would race up from Prashadam just to sit at their feet and sing Jagannath Swami, Nayana Patagahami Bhavadume. So by the time this event came, you can see how ecstatic the devotees are chanting. And uh, 
in some cases it was the first time that devotees from all these three European countries were together in one place. London Rath Yatra became so famous as the Long Walking Yatra. Later Srila Prabhupada also uh, walked in great ecstasy or danced in great ecstasy throughout the whole event. Srila Prabhupada commented about this Rath Yatra. He said, make the deities so beautiful that everyone will be attracted to them. Make it very opulent. So that was the direction that we were heading, was uh, to try to make the deities visible uh, for those that were witnessing them for the first time, the passers-by, and to increase the love of the devotees, already familiar with the Lord. Oh, how nice to see people who would never have had access to Lord Jagannath. So this was a, a real growth period in in London, just as there was a burgeoning of of youth interested in, in spiritual life and breaking out of the mold of the 50s and 60s in the United States. This happened in, in London at the same time. So mostly through the holy name, the Sankirtan, we attracted people. Sometimes it was prasadam, but mostly it was through Sankirtan. Look at them, the crowds, just immense. And this is only after being in England for two years. The first year, 1968, <laughs> we were the handful. 69, it was increasing, and this is by 70. Not even a full two years. Of course, Srila Prabhupada's arrival in 1969 was the catalyst. We were the seeds being planted, and he was the blossoming creeper of Lord Chaitanya's love. And when he came, everything ignited like a firestorm. It's like a firestorm, actually, with the, with the thunder and the veracity and the speed of a firestorm. I remember he sent us several letters, you know, guiding us on Rathiatra and saying things like, uh, you know, I wish that I was there. <laughs> uh, we knew we couldn't expect him to be there, but he was with us. Don't forget, this was the height of Krishna awareness in London. Everyone knew us. We were famous. The flashing billboards uh, in the center of London, Leicester Square. Everyone knew about the temple. We were part of the, the broadband culture of London at that time, 1970. George Harrison was our friend. Uh, John Lennon was our friend. All the famous people of England were aware of us. We were appearing in <laughs> concerts. <laughs> we were on the street every day, Oxford Street. And you can see by this time, many people were curious to see what is this Hare Krishna phenomenon. And more and more Indian people had joined us. At first, they were very leery of, of what we were doing, and they, they stayed away, they shied away. We had a, several core families, Indian families, were very, very helpful and very solid. Gradually, the, the majority of Indian people in London began to understand that this was the real thing, that this was Vaishnavism. Nicely dressed gentlemen. Prabhupada always used to say that only two places in the world a gentleman can live, India and England. <laughs> he liked the, the higher level of culture in England. The bobbies everywhere. They were helping. <laughs> they were helping move the deities. <laughs> Afterwards, they all said, the bobbies all said that was one of the most delightful public displays they've ever seen. Everyone was perfectly mannered. They got a, a little taste of the ecstasy themselves. All of the devotees were so enlivened in England in those days. It was such a ah, an ecstatic experience all the time. Things were humming and oh, they had a play. Civil disobedience. <laughs> 
<laughs> Not a great theme. <laughs> We were children, you know. We didn't know much about tact and diplomacy, politics. We did this for Prabhupada because we knew he would be happy. <laughs> See, Dan and Jaya playing the role <laughs> of John Kazi's men, and uh, Trubuvanath was um, playing a, a styrofoam merdanga. And we're enacting the scene here where. Uh, Chan Kazi and his henchmen are uh, attacking Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan party. Uh, the origins of the uh, street chanting were 500 odd years ago in West Bengal when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, the most recent uh, incarnation of Krishna, brought the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra into public. Here you see uh, yours truly playing the role of Lord Chaitanya, albeit uh, with contemporary microphone. And this was the enactment of a story that took place 500 years ago in India. Here we see Guru Das, one of the first uh, six disciples of Srila Prabhupada to come to London to open the temple, leading the, uh, the chanting. I suspect this is toward the end of the play where uh, Lord Chaitanya has uh, convinced the Kazi to allow the chanting to go on. The next day all the newspapers in London, all the front pages were filled with descriptions of the 1970 Rath Yatra. They had never seen anything like this in London before. Normally when this many people would gather in public for a parade, it would be some protest march. This was a celebration. We sent clippings from the newspapers that covered this Rath Yatra to Prabhupada, and he showed them to everyone. He said, you see, my devotees have conquered London. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada called San Francisco New Jagannath Puri. So devotees would come from all over the world to attend the Rath Yatra because Srila Prabhupada was, was there in attendance. Now, there was no Rath Yatras in Australia or Tokyo or Los Angeles, New York. So people would come from all over the world. And so it was a great uh, you know, occasion for the devotees to come together and celebrate that festival with, with Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, this is in front of the 518 Frederick Street. This is right on the sidewalk in front of Frederick Street. The devotees painting the canopy and upholstering the, uh, the asans. This was the biggest festival that was ever held in ISKCON in the, in the early days, 1970 Rathiatra. It was like this monster. Out of this little storefront, we created this huge publicity campaign and uh, we mobilized the whole city of San Francisco. All of this happened, all these three huge Roth carts, all generated out of this little teeny San Francisco center. You know, you, you really couldn't call it a temple. It was just a storefront. Yeah, teeny. Imagine the energy and the, uh, and you just, there was no consideration of yourself. You just never thought about yourself. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm wet. Oh, I'm cold. You just got on with it. You couldn't disappoint Prabhupada. At the time I was New devotee, been a devotee about four months. Of course, I'd been hearing Prabhupada's lectures and reading his books and listening to some of the recordings, and uh, there was a lot of anticipation about, well, about Rathayatra in general, but uh, the airport. We went to the airport to greet him. There was just so many devotees there, and we were just having this huge kirtan, waiting for Prabhupada to come. 
I had joined in 69 at uh, 518 Frederick Street, but I couldn't stay because I was a Canadian. So I went back up to Canada and moved into the temple in Vancouver. And I stayed there for <clears throat> six months. <clears throat> we came down for Rathiatra, and by that time I was really psyched up. Uh, you're meeting the spiritual master of the universe. You've been wandering throughout the universe for millions of lifetimes. Now, with this meeting, you're karma, everything is going to be relieved, so I was quite excited. You know, we're waiting for the plane to come in, and Prabhupada was coming off the plane, and he was walking up. It seemed like, to me, he was by himself. Maybe there were some devotees in the background, but the image I have is Prabhupada was walking up this plank, and he had this very innocent expression. I had never really seen a person exemplify that kind of humility before because he was walking up and he had this expression as if to like turn around and see who everyone had come to meet. But I got all the temple presidents to spend like a hundred dollars each and, and buy these white gardenias, these, those big beautiful highly scented gardenias. Each president stepped forward and gave him a huge white gardenia just covered with gardenias. His eyes were very penetrating. Something about his eyes. It seems like uh, Krishna Bhakti's comes from his eyes or something, but just for a second feeling his glance and just feeling the, the depth of that glance and uh, the, the intensity of emotion that everyone felt. We were just caught up and everyone around me and myself, tears were just coming from our eyes and just seeing a person who had characteristics that I'd never experienced before and feeling the, the intensity of the kirtan and uh, it was very moving to this day. We used to be able to do that, go into an airport and just rock it down, you know? Everything was for Prabhupada. We didn't know anything else. We didn't know anyone else. We were like clean slates. He taught us everything. We had no outside influence. Look at that. <laughs> He's dancing right in the airport. Why? Because he got a wonderful welcome and the devotees were so enthusiastic. So, you know, you reciprocated. And the more you could do for him, the more he would reciprocate in kind. That's the lot. Three carts are being built in that lot. And this is where Srila Prabhupada came to visit the Rathiyatra cart. And he amazed all the devotees. He just laid out flat on the dirt and paid his obeisances to the Rathiyatra cart. And he said, uh, the Rath is as good as the deity. <laughs> you can see Jainanda and Naranarayana there. Here it is, the moment of truth, actually. You see, we're pulling the Rathiyatra cars out into the street, more or less in front of the temple uh, on 518 Frederick Street. Uh, I'm in the middle of all of this because I figure if anyone's going to get squashed, I'm the designer and architect, and I should be the one to get squashed. When we had finally built them and realized how massive they were, we were scared stiff as to what would happen when we took them off the blocks and started rolling them down the hill. We thought they would continue to roll and go right through the temple door and out the back and down into the bay. I might add it had no bricks whatsoever, and therefore if it had gotten away, it would have gotten away. What we did with the paint was we used uh, natural earth pigments. I took deep tone latex base and mixed the pigments with water and had it shaken up at the paint place. And so what we did was we used the same pigmentation that they used in Jagannath Puri. Did you see how many men it was required to break the Rathyatra car? All of this was designed and built custom within a matter of a few weeks. I think we had about six or eight weeks in which we built everything from scratch. And uh, we were able to acquire lumber. We spent very little cash for lumber. Most of it was acquired from donation and wood that was left inadvertently lying around. 
Shil Prabhupada sent Narnarayan up to design the carts. And uh, I remember one, one meeting that Narnarayan was walking around the room holding his head, you know, and Shil Prabhupada said, well, what was, you know, what was a matter? Because you could see Narnarayan was in anxiety. And he told Shil Prabhupada that he needed special empowerment. He felt he needed a special empowerment in order to, to do these carts. And uh, he told Prabhupada it had to come in a name. So Prabhupada told him, all right, then for this now you have become Vishwakarma, the architect of the universe. <laughs> and Narnarayan lit up and that was all he needed to get his inspiration for figuring out how to, you know, how to build all the three cars because he had to invent the, the scopes for the domes coming down. The tops were designed so that the whole Rathiyatra car could slip under a 15-foot high overpass. So the entire part came down. We had it all designed the year before where you just took a pole and lowered it down, but that cart was only 35 feet tall. These were like uh, over 60 feet tall. And so we just were building it. We didn't think. And then Srila Prabhupada was in Los Angeles. He happened to talk to Tamal and said, and how is the lowering mechanism going to be used, designed? And Tomal said, oh, Narada Ryan is working on that. He knows all about it. He's, he's a genius um, engineer. He can do it, you know. So Srila Prabhupada said to Tomal, so who is checking on Narada Ryan? And Tomal said, oh, you don't have to check on Narada Ryan. He knows what he's doing. And Prabhupada said, why not ask? So Tamal phoned up. He said, ha, 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 I hate to ask you this. You know, I mean, it's so silly. But how are you doing the re mechanism? How is it raising up? And we said, well, we're just, uh, we're, uh, uh, we hadn't thought of how to do it. So Lochan, myself, Madhavisa, and Jayananda, we all sat there like for like four days without sleeping, day and night, not able to figure out how to raise that top. And finally, some or other, it came to me how to make this telescoping tube that could be raised up in increments, which is sort of the model that's been used ever since, except it's been made, you know, much more sophisticated since then, much better design. And then Prabhupada said sternly, no one should ever be in charge completely of something. There should be a committee to make sure. Because Prabhupada, if anyone, had tremendous confidence in what I could do, and Tamal had complete confidence in what I could do, and yet I had made the biggest blunder that could have destroyed the whole festival if we had not stopped and worked that out. When he first came to the temple, I never, you know, I wasn't very conscious of who he was, because that's a brand new devotee. And he came into the temple room, and everyone paid their obeisances. And when I had everyone had their heads down, I looked up at Srila Prabhupada, and he laughed. He smiled at me, and you know, it was my it was the, the first realization that I ever had. You know, that, that he was the first person that had ever loved me. That was very clear. That he was the first person in my life that had ever loved me, and then he knew clearly who I was and everything about me. I felt, you know, he saw right through me, whatever. Not, not in a bad way, not like saw through my artificiality, but saw who I really was. That was a very, very special thing. And then, you know, everyone sat down and he spoke a little bit. And then, you know, someone brought him a plate of sweets. And I remember he took a, took a golubjaman and he tossed it in his mouth from his lap. <laughs> Thinking that was so incredible. <laughs> I've tried it in the past and, you know, it just lands on my forehead or over my shoulder. But it was so incredible to watch him. Everything he did was so perfect and aristocratic. Oh, these are the horses. Well, this is interesting. My father made the horses. My father's a dramatic Holocaust survivor. His heart had flames coming out of it from the Holocaust in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so he built these horses. He painted them with fire and with smoke. They looked as though they were smoldering. And uh, he put them on the front of the Rathiatra cars, which was quite a contribution. Uh, four for each Rathiyatra car. I wanted to engage him, so I asked him to do it. But when I saw the horses, I was absolutely horrified. They looked like horses of the apocalypse coming out of hell. So my father was very proud of them. You know, they were rather dramatic horses. My parents, I should say, were separated for 40 years. So my mother was also at the Rathiyatra festival, and that my mother and father hadn't seen each other for, oh, maybe five years, you know. My mother walks up and said, who has made these horses? She recoils in horror, seeing these smoldering, burned, crazed horses with wild, rolling eyes. Who has made these horses? And I look at her and say, uh, my dad made them. 
said, well, this will never do. So she went and grabbed buckets of paint and painted them all up with nice, like, the merry-go-round design caparison and white and clean and healthy-looking horses. And there they looked at these horses together and they, they sort of felt, yes, this is what we've done to honor our son's choice. And I could see that they both felt great satisfaction. And from my perspective, as a budding transcendentalist, you know, two years in the movement, I thought, this is their devotional service. This is the moment that was created for them by Lord Krishna to accomplish something in their lives and to give my brother and myself permission to go forward with the power of the Pitris behind us. I got the Krishna book published in Japan by Dainapan. I had to go there to supervise. This is the first book with color photos. This was very special. The windows to the spiritual world. I went there, I think it was May, and I told Dainapan, I met with all the executives, that there was a festival in July, and I wanted to bring the book, the finished book, to the festival in San Francisco. So it meant that they had two months to produce the book. And they said, impossible. I said, well, there is no impossible. You have to do it. Because I want to present the book to the spiritual master at the festival. And they said, well, it's impossible, but anyway, we'll try. So they, they worked so hard. And I would go every day and push them. You know, every day I would ask them, are you going to have it ready? Are you going to have it ready? And they say, it's impossible, it's impossible. And then I, I booked my return flight to arrive in San Francisco the day of Rathiatra. And actually, they didn't have it ready. And I said, this is going to have serious repercussions for our future business with you and so on. And uh, then I, I went to the airport. So I was, as I was walking up the, uh, the, you know, the stairs to get on the plane, this big black limousine drove out onto the tarmac. It had flags on it. You know, Dynapon was one of the largest companies in Japan. They printed Time magazine and everything. This long black limousine, and it comes right to the airplane. And out come all the Dynapon executives, you know, in their blue suits. There are about five of them. So I went down, and they all bowing, you know, from the waist. And they gave me this carton. You know, the stewardess is saying, come on, you know, you got to get on the plane. You know, they had to take off. So I, I didn't, I just took the carton. I thanked them and uh, got on the plane. You know, couldn't wait for the plane to take off. It tore open the carton, and there is this silver shining Krishna book. It was so ecstatic. Then I start going through the book and looking at every pictures and you know how it all turned out and and there was this man next to me. He was a, a business executive, American. And he, he saw me, he said, uh, you know, what do you got there? And I said, oh, this is, you know, my spiritual master. I printed the book in Japan. It's the first book. And, and he said, how much is it? And I said, whatever I said, $10 or something, which was a good amount in those days. He said, okay, I'll take it. So then, you know, I came to San Francisco, went right away to Prabhupada's apartment. I brought in the carton, presented the book to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was so pleased, and he said, you know, how many copies do you have? I said, well, there were 20, but now there's only 19. He said, oh, only 19? What happened to the other one? I said, well, I, I sold it on the plane to the person next to me. Prabhupada said, oh, very good. This is very auspicious. But the first copy was distributed. Then he ordered, he said, all these books, there were only 19 of them, he said, these should all be distributed at the Rathiatra. And then the one that he had in his hand, and he said, and this one also. 
You couldn't see the deities until they were on the rough cart. That was the, one of our technicalities that we thought, you know, had to be there. And no one should view the deities until, it's like, you know, it was like looking at prasadam before you, you offer it. So nobody's going to see the deities until they get on the Rathiyatra cart. <laughs> and then, when they were all up on the cart, then they would be you know, revealed in all their magnificence. I think there was some disturbances going on, and Prabhupada had given uh, Vishnu Jan the Nishinga prayers. And Vishnu Jan had just been up with Prabhupada and came down, and we were on the street right in front of the temple. And uh, Vishnu Jan said to all of us that Prabhupada had given him this mantra for protection of the festival. And right on the street, he, he taught us. And I think this is the first time we chanted the Nishinga prayers. Myself and Gargamuni and others there, um, we did not want Prabhupada to go to the Rathayatra festival. What happened was that we got threats. The Black Panthers sent word that we're going to attack your guru if you hold this festival. And they were very credible threats. So we were, we were afraid. So we told Prabhupada that you, know, you shouldn't go to the festival. But Prabhupada couldn't accept us. First of all, he didn't care so much about threats. But second, it was just inconceivable that Prabhupada would not go to the Rathayatra. And Prabhupada insisted on going. And I was insisting Prabhupada not go. So Prabhupada insisted, you know, you must take me. So Gargamuni was driving the car, and he, he drove very slowly, and he took a very roundabout route in order to arrive late at the festival. Things started out well, but they quickly got worse. One of the carts had a certified weld that cracked, and Balaram's car was out of commission. The newspapers wrote an article called Harried Krishna. That was just after we were attacked by the Black Panthers. And so they had all these Black Panthers all in afros, black t-shirts, and black pants. And they attacked with some martial arts. And so Brahmananda and others were fighting them. And we had poles to keep them from getting crushed under the Rathyantra cars, very beautifully decorated poles. So we used these poles to fend them off. My father was dressed like an Old Testament prophet of old with his white beard, and he was stood there, and he had a staff. And he was crashing it onto the ground, crying, Tolerance! 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 We marched, literally, seven miles to the sea. At one point, there were cars parked on either side. I cried out, Move the cars! And 25 people would grab each car and just send it skittering. Now, Subhadra's cart had an interesting miracle attached to it as well. What happened is we came along and uh, Shamasundra had used a piece of malleable iron as the axle for Subhadra's cart. And it had started to get worn through after two years of Rathiatras, which we weren't aware of. So we warned everyone not to ride on Subhadra's cart because we were worried about it not being strong. But guess what? People got on anyhow and the wheel bent almost horizontal. And we thought, oh no, we've lost Balaram's cart. Now we've lost Subhadra's cart. What on earth are we going to do? So, it suddenly occurred to me, and I said, wait a minute, I want 50 people to lift Subhadra's cart. And 50 people rushed forward and lifted Subhadra's cart. And I want another 50 people to grab the wheel and bend it down again. And they did. They came and they took the wheel and that piece of iron that was two and a half inches thick, they just bent it back again so the wheel was perfectly vertical. And I said, now I want another 50 people to guard it so nobody gets on. And nobody got on. When Prabhupada arrived at Rathayatra in the middle of Golden Gate Park, all the devotees stopped. Srila Prabhupada was supposed to give a lecture at the beginning of the Rathayatra festival, but because there was some disturbance at that time, Prabhupada 
delayed his arrival and he entered Golden Gate Park uh, up the road about a mile or so from the beginning and then walked back towards the Rathiatra cart and took everybody by surprise. Prabhupada had many garlands that were giving to him and uh, he took one of his garlands off and he looked for Jainanda and he garlanded Jainanda with the, you know, the flower garlands that was given to him, making that, uh, you know, benediction to Jainanda. And Prabhupada began to dance in a circle. And you see Prabhupada's flowing robes. Bhavananda picked out the fabric for that cloth. I saw this really nice shimmery peach silk satin cloth, but it was actually, I think, like an upholstery cloth, but it was beautiful. So I wanted that, so I bought that, and I insisted, my visa was tear to seek out, I insisted on buying real pearls. I wanted to make real pearl buttons and a real pearl button on the side, you know, the little strap that goes under his chin on his Prabhupada hat, a real pearl there. So Madhavisa, mumbling and grumbling, gave me the, the money. And when Madhavisa brought the cloth over, Prabhupada looked at it and said, as you dress me, so I shall dance. Yeah, it was wonderful. He gave instructions about the dancing, I know that. For that year, I think it was 1970, that he told the devotees how to dance. In front of the deities, specifically, based on the descriptions that are in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. At that time, the Chaitanya Charitamrita was not available. In one group, Lord Nityananda would be the dancer in front of one chariot and another chariot. Uh, I think it was a Jaitacharya may have been the dancer, like that. It's basically for the pleasure of the deity, then you have an ecstatic dancer, not to impress the crowd, but in Krishna consciousness for the specific pleasure of the deity. Prabhupada was showing the devotees that he liked to dance. You know, not just the Swami step, but jumping up and down. That was a new revelation. <laughs> he introduced that at Lasyanaga Boulevard Temple, at the, at the temple. He had introduced the jumping. You know, before the Swami step was the uh, conservative dance step that was used by everybody. But when Prabhupada started to jump at the La Cienega Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles, that's when jumping became, uh, you know, part of the choreography of <laughs> the temple. At the start of the procession, we had speakers on Subhadra's car, and Jivananda and I and a couple other devotees were sitting in the back with microphones to have Kirtan over the microphone. Then Prabhupada sent word back that he didn't want the speakers anymore, and he just wanted Kirtan parties in the crowd, like in India. So Jivananda and I turned the speakers off, hopped out, and started doing Kirtan. We marched literally seven miles to the sea. Nobody thought of complaining or why don't we have buses to take us or something. People marched seven miles to the sea and when they got there at the Family Dog Auditorium, which was run by Chet Helms, who did all the Janis Joplin and Grateful Dead concerts and Moby Grape and Quicksilver and all that, there are those horses again. He let us use that place and there were 10,000 people waiting at the beach who hadn't wanted to go through the ordeal of marching. I was helping to cook and then I went down to the Family Dog Auditorium where Srila Prabhupada was going to come after. Uh, there were so many people that would participate actually that we filled the Family Dog Auditorium and simultaneously the beach was also filled with, with people and we were distributing prasadam in both places. And big kirtans were going on in both places. And I was in the Family Dog when Srila Prabhupada arrived. And it was just so wonderful. And Srila Prabhupada was such a swan amongst men. <laughs> and he floated into the family dog auditorium. There were literally thousands and thousands of hippies present. And they were all in their full regalia because this was a, a big event for them. So just ordinarily in that day, people's dress was interesting enough, but for this Rathiatra festival, they really decked themselves out. Many dressed as Radha and Krishna and, and, and similar costumes like that. And so Srila Prabhupada came amongst this. He walked onto the stage and he looked out amongst 
the throngs of hippies. And he smiled and he said, I have come to make all the hippies into happies. <laughs> and that evoked a tremendous tumult of transcendental roaring from all the devotees that were present. And everyone got swept away in this you know, wave, this tidal wave of ecstasy that was coming from Srila Prabhupada's heart and danced for hours and hours and hours. Vishnu John would just be chanting and, you know, swooning. And then he would just cry out, just chant and dance. And when you're tired, take prasadam and then come and chant and dance some more. And that's literally what went on for hours and hours and hours. There were so many unusual people there. And Srila Prabhupada explaining that, that the people in general had become hippies because they were disillusioned with modern society. But if they didn't find any guidance, then they would end up in a more difficult situation than the one that they had actually left. And he urged all of these uh, hippies, drug-taking hippies, to take up his message of Krishna consciousness and actually become first-class human beings. It was an amazing experience for me. I think it was what cemented my understanding that I should stay within the Krishna consciousness family. They assigned duties to everyone and I was to be in charge of making the feast uh, with the idea of feeding between five and 10,000 people, or maybe more. So, uh, Undaunted, I had never really cooked for large amounts of people, but uh, in those days, uh, you know, we could climb Mount Everest and not be tired. You know, was, Prabhupada's energy was just driving the movement so, so powerfully that uh, if we were given a duty to do, I mean, it was nothing. It was a feast, actually, that Prabhupada requested. There was so much prasadam there. We had gotten truckloads of watermelons donated. So at the end, we just stopped slicing the watermelons and just started giving whole watermelons to take home with them or to serve out. And it was the family dog auditorium. It used to be the shrine auditorium. It was the family dog auditorium. And Bhavananda had uh, gotten a bunch of barbecue grills and filled them with briquettes and just bags and bags of frankincense incense. So the whole place was just billowing with frankincense incense. But I remember that a bunch of the Hell's Angels followed us. They sort of got their fighting spirit out of them and they followed the uh, carts. So when we got to the Family Dog Auditorium, Prabhupada came on the stage a little bit later. We were all inside the auditorium. And when Prabhupada came in, all the devotees bowed down. And there was something so uh, magnanimous and also heavy about Prophet's presence that so many other people bowed down. It's not an unusual occurrence that people would just instinctively bow down that here's a saintly person. And I remember that it was a wood floor and when they bowed down, with, uh, it was a couple of Hell's Angels next to me and their chains and billy clubs and everything fell out and hit the floor and I was thinking how when all the Lord Brahmas, you know, all bowed before the uh, before Krishna and all their helmets, so I was thinking that Prabhupada and Kali Yoga, even the Hell's Angels with all their billy clubs and you know helmets and everything, and Prabhupada started the lecture. It was the most amazing thing because they were hippies and college students and from you know UC Berkeley and San Jose State, and then there were these Hell's Angels and there were Black Panthers. It's just such a montage, and Prabhupada started off his lecture by saying, "My dear, frustrated." Youth of America. When Prabhupada danced, when we had Kirtan inside the family dog and Srila Prabhupada danced, it, it was like, you know, it was very hard to even express w what it was like. Everybody, the crowd went ecstatic. I mean, not just devotees, all the people there were crying in ecstasy. It was just like, uh, it was like a miraculous event. Prabhupada looked like he floated. It appeared that his feet weren't even touching the stage. And then after the event, we had a little apartment for Srila Prabhupada that was just off of Frederick Street where Prabhupada was staying when he came up. 
And we drove up there, and uh, Prabhupada was sitting in the car, and the door was open. And I was standing there with Jayananda, and Madhavisa knelt down at Shri Prabhupada and said to Shri Prabhupada, was he pleased, you know, with, with the festival? And Prabhupada grabbed Madhavisa's head and pulled it over on his lap and rubbed his head like this and said, I loved it! And all the devotees went crazy over that. That was <laughs> It looked like Ramachandra and Hanuman. He looked just like Hanuman kneeling in front of Lord Ramachandra. So the whole thing just looked so regal. Prabhupada was so happy about the Rathiyatra festival and the success of it. He was just going on and on. He was saying, why have we done all this? Why have we put out all this energy to put on this festival? And he began to speak that this is the, this is the compassion of the Vaishnava. For the purpose of benefiting others, the Vaishnava goes to such great lengths to see to the preaching of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, this is Vaishnavism, this is Vaishnavism. Twice he said, and actually tears began to come to his eyes. And as the tears came to his eyes, he couldn't speak anymore. This is Vaishnavism. Uh, as he thought of the, the success of the Rathayatra. And so, being unable to speak anymore, he actually just waved his hand for everyone to leave. And I realized that I was going back to Hawaii very soon, so I let everyone leave, and I was the last one, and I paid my obeisances. And uh, Prabhupada saw me there, and he pointed to his servant at that time, it was Kartikeya Maharaj, to give me the garland from his deities. And so he put it upon me. And I realized that in this moment of Srila Prabhupada's uh, extraordinary compassion, I was getting his mercy in that form of that garland, and paid my obeisances and left. And I remember in the airport, after the ecstatic greeting in Kirtan, there were some reporters there, and, and this reporter kept asking Srila Prabhupada when it was that he realized God. And Srila Prabhupada, as we know, would never ever put himself forward or take credit. He was always a humble servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of the most intimate devotees of Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada would just explain to the person that, oh, you know, anyone can realize God and how God is there in the transcendental sound of His holy name. So Srila Prabhupada was trying to give him some philosophical understanding. But the man was very persistent and he kept inquiring, but you, Swamiji, when did you first realize God? And so Srila Prabhupada smiled and he said, I first realized God when I was five years old. And of course, Srila Prabhupada then said, actually, there was never a time when I, I did not remember God. So we know that, that Srila Prabhupada displayed the symptoms of a pure devotee from birth. He talks about that in the Bhagavatam and how uh, his symptoms also of, of holding Rathiyatra and worshipping Radha Krishna, these are symptoms of a liberated soul coming into this material world just for the purpose of delivering the conditioned souls. So here Srila Prabhupada confirmed his full God realization from uh, inception in this material world. Those were the old days before terrorism, so we just used to take these huge monster kirtan parties right into the airport. And then Prabhupada came, and I guess there was a press conference. And I remember I was standing right next to Prabhupada, and I just remember I was looking at Prabhupada, and suddenly my heart started fluttering, and just I felt the most incredible ecstasy that I've, I've never before or since felt that ecstasy. Just I was standing there looking at Prabhupada.
would all do like that. You see, we each given a flower, and then we would give it to him, and Shri Prabhupada would give us a flower in exchange. And occasionally he would stop and say something to one of the devotees, and we were all sort of hoping that he would stop and say something to us. I remember I had been staying there in the temple for about two weeks, and one day he stopped. And when I offered my flower, he said to me, Oh, you're new here? And I said, yes. And he said, are you happy here? And I said, yes. And he said, very good. <laughs> and took the flower and he continued. But it was very exciting. That was the, the, the most exciting part of the day as we'd all line up kneeling on either side of the entranceway into the temple. And the children would run down the middle and show the prop would show them some extra affection and play with them a little bit. Show them different flowers until they found one they liked. He was always very, very affectionate with the children. The exchange of flowers that um, started in Los Angeles uh, after Prabhupada came back from his morning walk was, was just uh, one of the sweetest and, and most memorable exchanges that I've ever uh, had in my Krishna conscious career with Prabhupada. Prabhupada would go on the morning walk and typically he would go to Venice, but not always, Venice Beach. And uh, then when he returned, prior to the greeting of the deities, uh, the devotees would be prepared for him in two lines, and all the children would be there. And it was such a, uh, a sweet time, everybody was so happy, uh, that it's so obvious that the, the children also uh, sort of uh, enjoyed the whole thing. The whole atmosphere was just completely enjoyable and family-like this wonderful, wonderful exchange of flowers with Prabhupada. And then this was going on outside the temple. I mean, it's, it, we could have done it inside the temple or something, but it was just there being done as Prabhupada dismounted from the car and, and we were right there on the street and greeting Prabhupada right when he first, first arrived there. Prabhupada got out of his car and as he got out of his car, Prabhupada had his foot there, and Denanath hopped down, grabbed Prabhupada's foot, had Prabhupada's foot in his hand, and he just, he's kissing Prabhupada's feet. And I'm like a new devotee, I'm like, he's kissing his feet, you know, the feet are considered to be the most objectionable part of the body not something that you would bend down and kiss. And uh, I'm looking down and, and Denanath, Denanath just completely ignored any kind of social convention, didn't, he had no concern for what anyone was thinking. And he was just, just kissing Prabhupada's feet and I just remember just, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And Prabhupada just let him do it. And, I it seemed like for you to turn out, I could I it was I just I can't believe it. <laughs> he was kissing his feet. <laughs> but uh you know, Dananath got the mercy. So Srila Prabhupada it was so personal in his dealings with the devotees, and that was one aspect that was so attractive to people in the early days of the Krishna consciousness movement, you see how Srila Prabhupada, he always relished reciprocating love with his devotees. It simply wasn't Srila Prabhupada asking for service or, or demanding things from his followers, but Srila Prabhupada always wanted to give back. And when Prabhupada would come to the temple in LA, I always think that's such a nice example of that, how Srila Prabhupada would reciprocate with us this, this bhakti, this exchange of love by giving flowers to the devotees as we would line up along the pavement, it was very sublime because Srila Prabhupada, he was never rushed. You know, we would give him a flower and then Srila Prabhupada would give us a flower. And I always think how Srila Prabhupada said that love is an exchange of feeling. You need two for love. And I remember he would, you know, sometimes when we would give a flower and then he would give one back, Prabhupada would just stand there. So when we bowed down, 
we could put our head right on Srila Prabhupada's feet. And he was always had this very ecstatic, blissful smile. And you could see that Srila Prabhupada loved us in such a way that was practically incomprehensible because he, you know, he saw us as this lost particles of spirit soul from Lord Krishna. And he was so happy to play a part in bringing us back to Krishna's lotus feet. That's me. Whoa. Nice with me there. <laughs> so this was just one of a real highlight in my life of being able to, you know, get a flower from Srila Prabhupada and give a flower back to Srila Prabhupada. So simple, yet so sublime. And there was always one devotee who would block Srila Prabhupada's <laughs> Um, walkway, his pathway into the temple, and just so he could get to ask Srila Prabhupada for his mercy or, or, or to say something to Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada never ever got disturbed or agitated that this person was being so, you know, so bold in his approach. He would always just shake his head wonderfully or touch the devotee on his head with a blessing. So we all felt that this was a very special time where Srila Prabhupada was really giving us a blessing. And when he was handing us this flower, it was like, you know, Prabhupada was touching our heart with that flower, that soft lotus petal of his flower-like glance. Shortly after uh, this exchange, we, everybody would follow Prabhupada into the temple and there was the greeting of the deities. Uh, prior to this, at least in Los Angeles, uh, uh, I don't think that there was a, a really a formal greeting of the deities ceremony. So I believe this uh, basically introduced the greeting of the deities ceremony as we know it today. Um, at least it certainly did in Los Angeles. And then uh, typically on many mornings, Shilabadi would fill the, the deity room with uh, frankincense, clouds of frankincense. And then when she opened the doors, the frankincense would often billow out into the temple and there would be this sort of cloud of frankincense, which also to me was very mystical and Prabhupada bowing down. And then afterwards he took Charnamrita and then he would proceed to his Vyasasan. And I remember uh, Vishnu John leading us in the Sangsara prayers. One time Prabhupada, at the end of the singing of the Sangsara prayers, uh, said very gravely, Sangsara dava nalili dhaloka, and then he t said the whole first verse, and he said, what is the meaning? And everybody was stunned, you know, <laughs> because probably a few devotees knew, but you know, after being quizzed like that from Prabhupada, nobody knew, and then one person recited the English meaning of the verse. But Prabhupada then said you know, that we should all know what the meaning was. It wasn't too long after uh, I joined that the Govinda prayer started to be played in the morning. The album had come from England, that uh, Radha Krishna Temple album. Just one morning it happened. It, it seemed quite spontaneous that uh, the deity doors opened up and the Govinda prayers went on. And Prabhupada went through as normal, offering his dandabats in front of each altar. But when he went around and he sat on the Vyasasan, tears were coming down his face. He, he, was, he was so pleased by the Govinda prayers and he wasn't able to speak for some time. We were celebrating, I believe it was the appearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj. And Srila Prabhupada uh, gave a lecture and he was saying how he had not done any service for his spiritual master. And he was thanking all of us, uh, implying that, you know, without uh, us, his service couldn't have been rendered when in actuality it was only by Prabhupada's mercy that we were able to render any service. And so he said, because I have nothing to offer to my Guru Maharaj, I'm going to offer all of you. And then Srila Prabhupada went and he performed arti 
to the deities, and he offered us to his spiritual master. I, I you know, don't, don't know exactly the spiritual process, but I definitely felt the result of Srila Prabhupada's kindly connecting us with his Guru Maharaj. And then after Arti, Srila Prabhupada turned and started dancing and the word can't really be uh, understood in terms of what Srila Prabhupada was manifesting. It's more like when Lord Chaitanya is described and he was dancing in a circle like a firebrand. It was like one continuous movement. Srila Prabhupada was hopping up and down across the temple room, back and forth. And the entire, you know, place where we were, the whole space, was immediately transported to another dimension. We were really out of the material world. And, you know, I was a very young devotee. And I remember to this day, you know, just my crying, tears running down, you know, my face and, and realizing how Srila Prabhupada was actually entering into our hearts and he was cleaning them, he was purifying us so that someday in the future we'd actually be able to render devotional service. We were sitting in Srila Prabhupada's room and Prabhupada had just had an RT for his little Radha and Krishna deities. He had music of himself singing, playing, and Prabhupada was playing cartels. We were sitting next to him and then when the RT was over, Jagadish handed Srila Prabhupada a letter from Dhammaraj Prabhu, requesting initiation. And so Prabhupada said he could get initiated. Then he turned to Jagadish and he said, do you know how to perform this fire sacrifice for the initiation ceremony? And Jagadish said, no, he didn't know how. And so Prabhupada instructed someone in the room to give Jagadish instructions on how to perform the fire jaga for the initiation. And he, at that time, he said, um, you have to know how to do this ceremony because someday you will have disciples of your own. He, he looked at me and I was like in my eighth month of pregnancy and he said just like before she was not mature but now she has become mature and she is having children of her own so in the same way someday you will also have children of your own. And when it was my turn, I was called up to Prabhupada's Vyasasan. And then he didn't chant the whole mantra. What he did was chant word by word in my ear. Then after that, he took the thread and put it on my shoulder, and he patted me on the shoulder, and he was smiling. And I was thinking, this is encouraging. And I was feeling like he was happy that I'd become a Brahmin and also perhaps felt that I was qualified, and that's why he was smiling and encouraging me. But I also felt that he was happy that he was making Brahmins, that he felt his movement was expanding, that now someone who had taken first initiation six months earlier was given a Brahminical initiation because he was following the process, the process was working. And I think this indicated to Prabhupada the future success of his movement, and I think that's why he was encouraged, and that, that's why he was smiling, that he felt that he's able to make Brahmins out of Westerners, and these Brahmins are needed in society to spread Krishna consciousness. At this time, there was the what Prabhupada considered to be the minimization of the spiritual master by the leaders, mostly from myself. I was the most infected with this I might say jealousy of the spiritual master. At this visit to Los Angeles, things were going wrong. From ISKCON Press, which I was in charge of, you know, the books were printed. Um, Prabhupada's title was not properly put. It was just A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. His divine grace had been left out. And even one book, one of the Bhagavatam chapters, just had A.C. Bhaktivedanta. Even the Swami was removed. I presented Prabhupada a book from Iskon Press from Boston that we printed, and he opened the book, and the binding just snapped right off. And this was in the temple, when the 
formal presentation was made. When he went in the temple and he took the Charanamrita and then he stopped and said, it is salt. And then um, on the altar, they had placed the Acharya photos. I think it was Bhakti Siddhanta's photo was placed upside down. To cure me of my disobedience and uh, jealousy, Prabhupada uh, ordered me to take sannyas and that sannyas would be a cure because I had to give up all my position. I was in charge of the press and the New York Temple. I mean, I, uh, that had to all be given up. Sannyas is a purification. I had no choice in the matter. Prabhupada just came down the stairs and just stood over me as I was bowing down and said, Tridandi Goswami, Brahmananda Swami, and then walked out. When we would come back through the alley, we would stop and right beneath Prabhupada's room in his window. And we would continue chanting there until Prabhupada came to the window and traditionally he would wave. On one particular day, we were out there chanting and Prabhupada looked out the window and waved and then he told Karandar, he said, don't involve them in this. And he was speaking about the controversy that was going on with the sannyasis. He said, don't involve them in this, they're innocent. I remember when Srila Prabhupada was getting ready to leave Los Angeles to go back to India and he wasn't feeling well. And that's when Srila Prabhupada spoke to us for the first time about Vani and Vapu. How Vani is a much more intimate association with the spiritual master than just associating with his physical form. But being absorbed in both hearing and executing his instructions and his teachings links the disciple in a much more intimate way with the spiritual master. In an eternal way, rather than a, a temporary way. So Srila Prabhupada spoke on that, and of course, you know, it was very encouraging to hear it, but at the same time, it was very sad as we felt great separation. Part of Prabhupada's leaving America, going back to India, is that uh, there were the circumstances of uh, myself uh, and some others that were so offensive that Prabhupada wanted to leave. But uh, another aspect is, is that uh, he did not want to leave. And there's a conversation, it's in the conversations, Prabhupada talks about how uh, Lord Dwarkadish wanted Prabhupada to go back to India and Prabhupada didn't want to go. Prabhupada didn't want to go because his spiritual master had given him the Western world to preach in and Prabhupada considered that his god brothers they were given uh, India to preach in so there was no need for him to be in India and uh, furthermore, that he had just gotten the Watsika Avenue facility and he wanted to develop that you know, as the world headquarters for the Hare Krishna movement. But in this conversation, Prabhupada says that uh, Lord Dwarkadish uh, ordered me to go. And um, he said, I was talking with the deity and I was arguing with Lord Dwarkadish that uh, I don't want to go. And Lord Dwarkadish was commanding me to go, that I want you to go. And Prabhupada is saying, but I have this very nice temple and I want to develop it. And Lord Dwarkadish said, all right, um, I want you to go to India, that if you go to India, I will give you a temple that is better than this Watsika. You know, Prabhupada couldn't refuse that. And Prabhupada said, all right. 
And then, of course, Prabhupada came to India, and Prabhupada got the Krishna Balaram Mandir. When Srila Prabhupada was leaving at the airport, my son Gopal was three years old, and he sat next to Srila Prabhupada with all of his servants while we were waiting for Prabhupada to board the plane. And they offered Srila Prabhupada a glass of orange juice, and Prabhupada said, give it to him, he will drink it. So my son drinks the orange juice, and then they give the cup back to the servants, and they fill it up again, thinking we'll give Prabhupada another glass of orange juice. And Prabhupada said, give it to him. And then he says, he says, you want to come? He says, where's your ticket? <laughs> and then um, he, he nudged him with his arm, and he said, so you'll be the next Acharya? Like that. Devotees were all putting on garlands, and I came up and paid my obeisances and touched Prabhupada's lotus feet and put the garland on him. And then when I bowed down to, to touch Prabhupada's feet again, he looked down at me, and I looked up, and that was the, when I knew that this was my spiritual master. After that, m my material life was like a waning moon. No nothing really that I was, had been doing before was any longer satisfying. And I would just remember that and think of Prabhupada and, and want to do more and more devotional service. That was the effect that Srila Prabhupada had. Prabhupada had been in L.A. for eight months. It was <laughs> just the longest period of time. I mean, the devotees in L.A. had become so accustomed to Prabhupada's presence every day. And they just had him. And they were so, they just cherished him. And the L.A. temple was was just growing like anything. Prabhupada's presence just seemed to you know, make everything blossom. Devotees were joining every day. Everything was really expanding. So the devotees were very attached to Prabhupada. Eight months he had been there. Then not only was he leaving, which they, they kind of thought that he would never leave, and the LA temple had set itself up, it was managing in such a way that he didn't have to manage directly. He had good managers there and he was very pleased with it. So he could stay there peacefully and do his translation work and do his writing and do whatever he wanted and there was no inconvenience for him. So when Prabhupada said he was leaving, it was a, it was a shock. And then not only did he say he was leaving, but he said because he was old, he said there's a, a good chance he wouldn't return, but we should carry on the movement. Anyway, so the devotees took that very hard. At the airport, everyone was crying. We ran out to the fence to watch the, the plane. And new devotees, old devotees, everybody was crying. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare When I would come down from Berkeley to LA to see Prabhupada, you would fall asleep in the Brahmacharya Ashram to Vishnu Janan playing harmonium. And then you would wake up in the morning to Vishnu Janan playing harmonium. And you would, you would never know if he ever even slept. I mean, maybe he did. I'm not saying he didn't sleep. But I mean, that was like how non-stop Krishna conscious Vishnu Janan was. You sensed that about being in Vishnu Janan's presence, that he was just an otherworldly being. To see Vishnu Janan and Srila Prabhupada was the most wonderful thing to watch. When, of course, everybody wanted to have Prabhupada lead Kirtan when Prabhupada was there. But Srila Prabhupada would always want Vishnu Janan to lead Kirtan. And when they would look at each other, 
you'd start crying sometimes just to see Prabhupada and Vishnu Janan looking at each other. You know, there was just so much love the way Prabhupada would look at them. You never saw anybody ever look at anybody like that. You know, Vishnu Janan would always be emotional, get teary eyed. This is August 1970, New Vrindavan. I was a brand new devotee and Satsarup Das Adhikari and Uddhava. Prabhu drove some of us new guys down from Boston to New Vrindavan for Janmashtami festival, which was the festival in ISKCON at the time, it was pre-India gatherings. In those days it was standard practice in ISKCON to do near jal fasting on, on these big days like Gaur Purnim and um, Janmashtami and Vaspuja, which means no food and no water. And at midnight on Janmashtami, we'd have a little breakfast drink, like a salty lemon drink, and, and that was it. And then we'd fast all day till noon on Vyaspuja. You know, it wasn't considered any kind of fanaticism. That was just the standard. That was just what we did. This was the first uh, international GBC meeting where all the devotees Prabhupada had chosen to the governing body commission met together for the first time to begin sharing some of the load of management that Prabhupada had carried alone through the entire movement up to that time. There was some controversy going on in the ISKCON at that time. He was testing our abilities to manage the movement. Subal, Brahmananda, Gargamuni, and Vishnu John were together and they came to this president's meeting. They weren't presidents, they were new sannyasis. Now the president's meeting was happening in the temple building on New Vrindavan, and meanwhile the first GBC meeting was happening at Hayagriva's house, which was on a little hill right next to the temple, but up the hill. Brahmananda and Gargamuni and Subal, Vishnu John didn't have much to do with it, took over the president's meeting and started doing this whole trip on us about how we were gotten way ahead of ourselves, we, we couldn't even understand who Prabhupada was, what to speak of understanding who Krishna was, and we should understand that our entire relationship was with Prabhupada. And when you read Bhagavad Gita, you shouldn't read Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, you should read Srila Prabhupada Uvacha. So what do I see when I jump out of the van hours and hours later from Boston is uh, one of our sannyasis holding somebody against a fence and saying, Prabhupada is God, Prabhupada is Krishna, and because we haven't recognized this, he's left us. There I was, brand new, thrilled by Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, joining the Hare Krishna movement, and here I, two months later, I'm attending my first festival, and I, right before my eyes, I appear to be seeing the entire movement torn asunder by this controversy. Prabhupada confronted us, myself specifically, with the minimization in Los Angeles uh, at, before taking sannyas. It was the most shocking experience of my life. Prabhupada's chastisement was so severe. Spiritually, I could feel Prabhupada withdrawing his mercy. And then Prabhupada uh, gave us the sannyas, so I felt, and the others, that we have to compensate for the minimization. And the way to compensate for that was to uh, emphasize Instead of under-emphasizing Srila Prabhupada, we should now over-emphasize him. Our devotees were leaving. They were blooping. You know, there were devotees just crying and walking down that road, down the bottom of the mountain, and just leaving. Now, these are devotees who are totally dedicated to Prabhupada. There's no other reason for them to be in this movement. There was nothing except Prabhupada. So every devotee that you see in this film 
they're there because of Prabhupada. They're in the movement because of Prabhupada. No one else, nothing else. And suddenly, these men announced to us that Prabhupada has left and is never coming back. We've offended him. The mood was chaos. And they also said, unless we could chant purely, we shouldn't chant at all. We would be offenders to the holy name. And this was a new idea because Srila Prabhupada had taught us that we become purified by chanting, that there's a clearing stage and, you know, I mean, it, but, but you do it and you become purified by doing it. And um, this was devastating news to me personally and to everyone. It, it's atmosphere of total depressive devastation took over everyone and everyone was like wailing and weeping and thinking we were all going to have to leave Prabhupada because we couldn't chant purely, you know, I mean, it, it really like cast a spell on everybody. I remember at the time, I would listen to them. They wouldn't make any sense to me. I was, I was 28 years old in 1970. And I would listen to them. They wouldn't make any sense. But I knew Prabhupada. I hadn't met him, but I knew he, he had something. So I would go in front of this very primitive altar that they had, and on the lower step, they had Papa's picture. And I would sit in front of his picture, and I would cry. And I would talk to Papa. i say, Papa, when would these kids grow up? Why don't you come and help? I mean, I would never get angry at them. I would feel like they were innocent. They were wonderful, they were sincere, they were genuine, they were beautiful, but they were childish. Srila Prabhupada had just formed the GBC that summer, and their first act, as far as I'm aware, is to consult Prabhupada about what his new sannyasis are saying. And Prabhupada's response is, this is, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's nonsense, it's not true. The spiritual master is not God. The poison here is personal ambition, because if the spiritual master is God, that means you can become God too. So it's my Vad philosophy. And of course, um, Prabhupada's books were being consulted by both sides to prove this or that. But, but Prabhupada uh, responded very strongly and uh, he expelled them. To me, that experience is it was like the loss of innocence. The ISKCON movement lost its innocence at that point. Because before that, it was all like innocent and simply Prabhupada. And after that, even though, you know, the movement continued and it, and it was wonderful, there was, there was this opening for this, this maya, this contamination to enter. So finally, it got philosophically straightened out, and, and the sannyasis fled. They just like disappeared, like, I think, in the middle of the night. Nobody knew where they went. Prabhupada was in Japan at the time, you know, and we had our by letters and so on, so it took time, but basically we were like arrested and put into a van, and Bhagavan drove the van to Detroit. Everybody was still uh, upset by the whole thing, and I didn't want them talking to any of the devotees. So now that I recall, I locked them in the attic. <laughs> and we just sent food up there, and nobody was allowed to talk to them. And then either I got word from Prabhupada, or I just decided to send them out to preach, and they ended up going up to Ann Arbor. We went out into the street. I had a quarter. That's all I had was a quarter. And uh, the four of us went walking down the street. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know what to do. I felt very, very disturbed, very, I mean, to be asked to leave devotees, uh, you know, was the most terrible thing. What, what could be worse? But at the same time, we were forced to take shelter of Prabhupada and Krishna. We felt, well, this is what sannyas is. You have nothing. And we just walked down the street. 
We walked as far as we could until it became night. Then uh, we had to, had to sleep somewhere. So uh, along the roadside, there were these big fir trees. And fir trees, you know, very thick. So they offered some protection. And they, the, the needles make a very soft. So we slept under the fir trees, on the needles. It's interesting, in the morning, we woke up, and we were right outside the front gates of the Ford Motor Company of Detroit. <laughs> and then interesting things happened. You know, we had no food, we had no money, and we were just starving. And then we um, sat under a tree, and we had kirtan and read to each other what else we were going to do. And as we were doing this the first day, I'm telling you, you're not going to believe this, but a little boy came up, and he had with him a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk. Where did this little boy come from? And he said, here, my mommy told me to give this to you. And he put the bread down in the middle and then ran away. This was the first wave of devotees to enter India as a group of Westerners, the World Sankirtan Party from Iskand. And it was on Prabhupada's personal order and invitation that we were together. It actually became very second nature for us to immediately begin Harinam Sankirtan, wherever we were. That was what we were going to India for. It was under the banner of the World Sankirtan Party. So we had no, um, we didn't have second thoughts about having immediate Kirtans. I know I was nervous there because, uh, you know, there were guards standing around with uh, rifles, and uh, we were in Muslim land. Um, but we were, we were bold. At that point, we were on our way, and um, our devotion to Prabhupada was our, our focus. We had no idea about India, what was in store, but we knew we were being led, and uh, we had our mission. Most people had their faces skewed, staring and wondering, what are they doing? We even tried to, to preach to them in, in, in English. And as soon as the kirtan party would stop, we would all either chant Japa with some ferociousness or go out and preach to whoever was standing and staring at us. There's the famous Brothers Airway plot plane that was really not an, a fit for human travel. It was the inside of a, of a freight, <laughs> freight company's plane with absolutely no facility. You could see straight into the cockpit from uh, the main body of the plane. I remember there were these guards with big machine guns, huge, huge guns, pointed at Giraj as he was walking along. They couldn't put him in a a category and weren't sure what he was invocating, but they had his guns on him and he was completely oblivious, immersed in the holy name. I took a walk. I just didn't want to watch. And I took a walk around the plane, chanted myself, you know, prayed for protection. And when I came back around the plane, I looked over. The first thing I saw were two machine guns leaning up against the bus and Giriraj Maharaj holding one guy in each hand and these Egyptian military guys are jumping up and down chanting Hare Krishna with big grins on their face. <laughs> Our Sankirtan party from Europe and England arrived in India on October 4th, 1970. 
And I was only in Bombay for under two weeks, but those two weeks were two of the most powerful two weeks in my life. Because at this time, Srila Prabhupada allowed us to taste kirtan in Lord Krishna's Bharat Varsha. The center of our activity every single day was Nagar Sang Kirtan. That was our main engagement. We had prasadam in the morning, a morning program, chanted our rounds, and then went out in kirtan, sometimes twice a day. This kirtan party was so wonderful. We were like a family, a tight family. And each person played a role. Those are Malati's banners, so the same ones we brought from England. The, the heartbeat of our kirtan were the Rindangas of Dinanath and Rishi Kumar. They kept the rhythm going, and all of the rest of us played either another drum or kartals. And we were shoulder to shoulder, just like god brothers and god sisters, with so much affection and respect we had for each other. And we felt as if Srila Prabhupada were our father and we were all his spiritual children. And there was such a nice mood in this early Sankirtan leg of Srila Prabhupada's mission in India. We were enthralled by the streets of Bombay. Everything was so new and exotic. I think the people were enthralled by us, too, from the way they looked at us. But we were uh, thrilled to see how Krishna conscious the people were. We'd see people wearing dhotis and kurtas, and of course, most of the women wore saris. We'd see cows. We'd see names of buildings and businesses that included the holy names of Krishna and Rama. And um, we were just enthralled. And at the same time, filled with the sense that we were pioneers in Srila Prabhupada's mission, working to please him and serve him according to his uh, superior guidance and vision. And we had faith that the whole process would culminate in some wonderful result. There were many engagements, and Prabhupada would just have us set up anything for him to speak. It didn't matter if it was small or large or in a seedy part of town. And when he spoke about Krishna and sang the holy names, he was happy and he would get energy. And sometimes we would even say, well, Prabhupada, we went to this place before and two people showed up and we don't know if it's worth your time to go there. And Prabhupada would say, no, I'm like a cow. I give milk anywhere. That is what I like to do, and we would go, just go with him. This place, that place, this town, that town. We just like to be with him. After Kirtan took place, Srila Prabhupada wanted his books displayed. And he would inevitably speak something of his books or have a disciple speak something about his books and surround himself with his books. And I can think of no place where this activity didn't take place, where he didn't want his books displayed and sold and made available. He would very oftentimes give a gift copy to whoever was hosting. Srila Prabhupada taught us how to drink water without touching the glass and how to peel a banana without touching it with our left hand, with our teeth. And he said, you know, everyone will be watching you very carefully. So, you know, you should do these things nicely. He was tireless when we were in India. He went from engagement to engagement to engagement. And then in the evening, he would uh, speak public lectures. And then every morning, we would get up early and have um, arti and morning lecture on the Bhagavatam in his room. The Somanis uh, were a very religious and um, wealthy family of Bombay. Uh, the senior Somani 
at the time was G.D. Somani, and he became a life member, and gradually the other brothers and then sons and nephews also became life members. Uh, but they were very um, devout Hindus, and they were very uh, active in promoting Hinduism in India. And when they met Srila Prabhupada and practically all the uh, pious and aristocratic Hindus of Bombay and India in general, when they came to know about Srila Prabhupada and the work he had done to spread Sanatana Dharma in the West and throughout the world, uh, they were astonished. They felt here is the first time that someone from India has gone abroad and really uh, made an impact on people's lives, really brought people to Sanatan Dharma, to Krishna consciousness. And they wanted to come forward and help. They wanted to be part of the great movement that Srila Prabhupada had started. And at the same time, Srila Prabhupada had the idea that the people of India want to imitate the West. They want to imitate the Americans. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada had the idea that if the Americans take to Krishna consciousness and then the Indians see it, they'll also want to imitate <laughs> the Americans taking to Krishna consciousness. And actually, Srila Prabhupada's thought worked. People looked again at their own tradition, at their own culture at their own practices and saw there must be more there than they even thought themselves. Otherwise, why would Americans and Europeans who had every chance uh, to enjoy material facilities and sense gratification, why would they be chanting Hare Krishna and dancing, and studying Bhagavad Gita and preaching? And then why would they come to India? So they were thrilled. Uh, and sometimes they were so moved when they saw us, tears would come to their eyes. Uh, they were just so, so touched. At the end of Srila Prabhupada's visit, uh, Kailash Saksari arranged a huge program on the terrace of his house and uh, invited all the elite of Bombay, and they came. But the thing that struck all of us was Srila Prabhupada's humility. Here he was addressing some of the most affluent and aristocratic and influential people of India. And he spoke very briefly. He referred to his disciples and his work in the West. And then he appealed to the ladies and gentlemen present he spoke the verse from Prabodhananda Saraswati, Dante Nidaya Trinakam Padayor Nipatya. You're very learned and intelligent and pious people. I stand with the straw in my teeth and I beg you, please chant Hare Krishna. And then he went into the last kirtan. One time they were having a, a yogi sangha or samelans where many yogis come from all over India to speak, a venue on Chaupati Beach in, in Bombay. Many different swamis and yogis were sitting up on this stage. And each day several of them or one of them would speak. And they invited Prabhupada and, and us to come down there. And at first, they didn't like the idea that Prabhupada would have us up there on the stage with him. But he told them that these Western Vaishnavas are every bit as spiritually advanced as the other yogis and swamis here. I want them up with me. And they agreed. Prabhupada was introducing us to India as the real authentic thing, that we're, we're swamis and yogis in our own right. He was very proud of us, and at the same time he was showing us his country, he was also showing his countrymen what he had done in the West. And the huge crowds came down, all very intelligent, high-class families, 
came down to hear the yogis speak, and here was Prabhupada stealing the show. No one could put on a show like we could. <laughs> Nobody even came near. <laughs> uh. This was in Bombay. The program was a, was a San Kirtan procession where they took deities on a Kirtan procession. They had bands. The bands were playing the Mexican hat dance. Da-dum, 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 da-da-da-da-dum, da-dum, 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 da-da-da-da-dum, da-dum, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know the Mexican hat dance? That's what the band was playing for the deity, for Radha Krishna deities. We were chanting along with the Mexican hat dance. I remember that. And we got out on this pier, and there were several speakers to speak, and one of the other speakers was one of the most famous Mayavadi sannyasis in Bombay. And Prabhupada knew his name. He was in the Shivananda line, which is the big Mayavadi Shivite line in India. Almost every one of the big gurus that came to the West was a disciple of Swami Shivananda in Bombay. And this guy was his successor. And then Prabhupada spoke, and he said, so you've been listening to such and such, or such and such is here, and he is very famous, and he mentioned him by name. And he is impersonalist. He does not believe that Radha Krishna are the supreme personality of Godhead. But I will tell you something that I know. In secret, he is worshiping Radha Krishna deities. And the man smiled real big, and Prabhupada had him. <laughs> he said, even though he says he does not believe God is person, he cannot resist worshiping Radha Krishna. <laughs> Sankirtan at Mathura Junction Station. This being such a holy place and the first time that any of us had touched the Holy Dham, we were in a trance of ecstasy, feeling Lord Krishna's presence by Srila Prabhupada's mercy. When we jumped from these trains to do Kirtan, it was the life-giving aspect of our existence. The trains were just vehicles to take us from one kirtan to another. That Srila Prabhupada allowed us to become so attached to kirtan is a miracle. But it was from the beginning in India our main activity. Very often times people didn't join in in the kirtan because they were so quick at just a short four or five minutes in a station, sometimes ten minutes. And it was so nice, our party, um, various people would lead kirtans. It was not one person all the time. People shared the leading of the kirtans. Such a nice experience. And again, the camaraderie was so strong. <laughs> When we passed Kurukshetra, Srila Prabhupada called us all to uh, the train car. We were standing looking out the train car door, and Srila Prabhupada took his left hand and uh, unfolded his arm and said, This is where the battle of Kurukshetra took place. And all of the devotees paid obeisances while we were speeding along in the train. Then we had a small stop in Kurukshetra station, and we jumped out and performed kirtan. We all felt so fortunate to be with Srila Prabhupada. Arrival in Amritsar. 
Srila Prabhupada was so tireless in this preaching phase. From Mangalarti until 11 o'clock at night, we had engagements. And all of his youthful devotees, 25 and early 30s, could barely keep up with Srila Prabhupada. And when we weren't having kirtan at the pandal itself, we did Nagar kirtan throughout the streets of Amritsar. And they were very receptive to our kirtan party. This is a very large Sikh population where the Golden Temple is. One day we were brought to have a tour of the Golden Temple. And no pictures like a mosque. And at the top of the little temple there's a grantha. The holy book is there and they sit reading it all the time. And after we went there, we went to the chapati room. In those days they were feeding anywhere from six to 8,000 people a day a free meal. The, the pit itself must have been about 12 or 14 feet across. And suspended over the middle of the fire was a big old cast iron plate. And then around the room were all these Indian men and women rolling chapatis. As we sat and watched, there were chapatis unpuffed and puffed, flying through the air in the room all the time like flying saucers. Prabhupada said, see how they are doing this. This is how you distribute prasadam. He really liked it. He said, learn to do like this. <laughs> The citizens of Surat would greet us with sandalwood paste and kum kum, and many times they would um, come and, and give us bananas and mangoes and whatever kind of fruit they had. And we were pulled into people's houses from the middle of Kirtan and offered, you know, a cold lassi or some sweets. And the whole town was just suffused with Krishna consciousness. The entire town was on fire with, uh, with devotion. They made us even more spiritual and more devotional. We'd done Harinam in many places, but the people made this an experience of a lifetime. And Prabhupada was tireless. He would speak nonstop. He would greet the children and give them the little sweets and he would sit for hours and have darshan with thousands of people. People were just so kind to us and so genuinely sweet. Prabhupada said when we were in Surat, this is a city of devotees. They basically closed the whole town off for Prabhupada. They would close off streets and have parades with him and every shop would shut down. The man who we stayed at his home, Bhagavad Jariwala, was a, a beautiful, small-bodied, um, elderly, very healthy-looking Indian banker. I remember we all had dysentery there, too. It was pretty serious, 20 sick devotees. And they just took care of us. They just kept taking care of us. Whatever we needed, they would take care of it. And at the end, when we left, Bhagavad Jariwala talked, and he said, I want to thank all of you for this wonderful experience. It's been an honor to serve you. And please forgive me for any offenses I've committed. And he started crying. And Prabhupada looked over at us and he said, just see, this is a Vaishnav. And then he gave us all money. After we had been offensive and sick in his house. And, but they never took offense. They never took any, the whole family. They just served and served and served and served and served. I remember in one town we, where we uh, arrived that the whole town had closed shop. The mayor came, everyone came to the train station. In other words, the whole cl town closed down to greet us, to, to greet Prabhupada. And um, I don't know who was the mayor, but some dignitary said that even if Indira Gandhi had come to this town, she would not have received the reception that they have uh, organized for Prabhupada. And especially this program in Surat, every day they would take us to a different part of the town to do Harinam. And the devotees were just 
received like they had just, you know, flown in from a heavenly planet. I mean, it was just overwhelming. I remember at one point I, I started weeping because I could understand that this is what's meant by Lord Chaitanya's mercy and the, the flood of the Sankirtan movement. Because just uh, a few years before, we were just on the street. <laughs> vagrants and hippies and whatever. I mean, the potency of Prabhupada was manifested through his early disciples in settings like Surat in India, where people, by the thousands, I mean, they, they were hanging out the window off the roof in the street. It was packed wall to wall, uh, just enough room for the devotees to pass through. But they were so... And, chanted and mesmerized by the presence of the devotees chanting Hare Krishna, you could understand that uh, this was because of Prabhupada. We were just following behind him like, uh, you know, little ducklings follow the, follow the mother. Sometimes gentlemen would come to meet Srila Prabhupada and discuss with him. Once I was struck when Srila Prabhupada told one gentleman uh, that the government of India should have a department of Bhagavad Gita, that Bhagavad Gita is the greatest asset of India and it should be preached all over the world. But then he said, unfortunately, the government is neglecting. Quite often he would say that that India's ambassadors go all over the world and beg, give me money, give me rice, give me this, give me that. Uh, and Srila Prabhupada said, but I am going not to beg, but to give. I'm giving the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita and people are appreciating. <laughs> Before we went to India for the first time in San Francisco in 1967, Achyutananda sent us pictures of Srila Prabhupada and Nagar Sankirtan in Calcutta. And when we saw Prabhupada chanting in the streets of India, in this one still picture, all of us were just praying for the day that we would join Srila Prabhupada. And he said he would take us to India and show us India on foot. And when we were in San Francisco, we had no idea what that meant. But this is what it meant. Going on pilgrimage to a place is one thing, but until you're on foot in the streets, walking as those before us have walked, chanting the holy name, you can't taste India. Surat is near Dwarka, and so it's a traditionally Vaishnav province. Um, they worship mostly Bal Krishna in the Balabacharya line, but any Krishna worship is very popular there. And so Mr. Jariwala was very respected in the town. And he, you know, like he, every day he had our um, Kirtan route printed in the newspaper. So people knew exactly which streets we were going to be on. And they had those streets streamered with sari cloth all the way across the roads. Everybody had little white chalk auspicious diagrams in front of their houses on the sidewalk. And they were out there with kumkum and rice and, and flower garlands to put the, the red kumkum and rice on our foreheads and garland us. We got so many garlands put on us that after a while we had to take 20 of them off and put, pass them out to the crowd. And next thing you know, we'd have 20 more garlands on. We got garlanded 50 times in the course of each procession. And people were doing artik to us in the street as we went by in the kirtan procession. <laughs> Basically, that was just a ton of fun. Generally, the women were placed in the front in Sankirtan in those days rather than in the back. And we all danced in the same way. Or sometimes we were in the middle of the Kirtan party and the men surrounded us. Shamsundar and Koshali and Yamuna and Malati and Hansadutta, Tirananda, Giridad, Gopal. This was the time when we 
met Mr. John Greiser for the first time, who came to film uh, Srila Prabhupada, and he joined our party. I think he was the only non-devotee in our party. And that person later became Yadubhara Das. I first met Srila Prabhupada here in Surat. I'd come to India to do a master's degree thesis in photography on the origins of Krishna consciousness in India. The summer before, I'd done a couple of magazine articles on the movement. That's me in the blue shirt. I brought those magazine articles with me and showed Srila Prabhupada, and he liked them. He went through each of them page by page, much to my embarrassment, because one of them had some nudity in it. Srila Prabhupada didn't bat an eye, he just kept going through until he reached the article on Krishna Consciousness. And then his comment was, even we find gold in a dirty place, we take it. The second day I was there, Srila Prabhupada asked me, so you're going to become a devotee? I couldn't imagine myself wearing the robes and the shaved head, so I said no. Although inwardly I felt I was. So Srila Prabhupada's reply was, then you cannot stay. I was naturally shocked. And I didn't leave. I stayed with the party for two months. Every day I'd sit in Srila Prabhupada's room, and invariably when a visitor came in, he'd introduce me. He would say, this is Mr. John. He is from America. He is an expert photographer. In this way, Srila Prabhupada encouraged me, and he could understand I was becoming a devotee gradually. We were brought into the Durga temple. This one was new, the deity was new, she was nicely dressed and nicely worshipped. When we came into the room, I remember Prabhupada said, do just exactly like I do. And when Prabhupada came before the deity of the demigod, he bowed down before the demigod, just like he'd bow down before the Radha Krishna altar. But instead of putting his left side toward the altar, he put his right side toward the altar. He said, when you bow down before a demigod, you keep the demigod on your right. The understanding is your spiritual master is in front of you and Radha and Krishna are on your left. So you're still bowing to Radha and Krishna and your guru, but you're also offering respect to the demigod at the same time. And that's how you offer respects to a demigod, with your right hand side toward the altar. In other words, he was respectful to Durga, but he didn't want her worshipped in the same way that we would worship Radha and Krishna. So that's the distinction. Not only did we um, have kirtan through the streets of Surat, many times they would invite us outside town for engagements in the villages. And Prabhupada was so available to us at all times. And one time I had gone into his room. We were staying at the house of Bhagavad Jariwala. Uh, I went into his room and I told him I had memorized the Sri Sopanishad. And so on one of these engagements, after speaking, he called me, he said, Koshalya, come here. So I came up to him, and he said, sing Sri Sopanishad. I went, oh, God, I'm on the spot now. <laughs> so I did it. I sang the Sri Sopanishad. And um, the whole time, I'm looking at Prabhupada while I'm singing. And his smile, he's gradually becoming more and more pleased, and his smile is getting bigger and bigger. And when I finished, he called me closer to him, and, and I started to pay my obeisances, and he grabbed my head and put it on his lap and patted me on the back and rubbed my head. I felt like a puppy dog. It was really special. As in other places, we would go into Srila Prabhupada's room early in the morning and sing the prayers to the spiritual master. So one morning, after the prayers, Prabhupada gave a little talk, and then he asked, why does Krishna come into the material world? So different devotees gave different answers, but Dinanath Prabhu gave the answer that he comes to give pleasure to the devotees. And Srila Prabhupada said, yes, that was the right answer. Because the other purposes could be fulfilled by other agents, but only Krishna could come and satisfy his pure devotees. So after Dinanath gave the answer, Srila Prabhupada said, now you are liberated. Because the Bhagavad Gita says, janma karma chame devyam evam yo veti tattvata. 
that one who knows about the appearance and activities of Krishna in truth, tattva dehang purnarjanma naiti mameti soarjana. He never has to take birth again, but he goes back home, back to Krishna. When we would come back from the Hari Nam Sankirtan in the mornings, many of the people of Surat would be following the Hari Nam party. But although Prabhupada wasn't with us physically on the Hari Nam Sankirtan, he was in the back of everyone's minds. He was in the back of our minds because whatever we were doing was for him and he was in the back of everyone else's minds because he was the great saintly person who had gone to the West from India and taken Krishna consciousness to the foreigners. So when we got back to the Jariwala house, people wanted to see Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada would be in his room doing his own work but sometimes the demand of the audience from below was so great that Prabhupada would emerge onto the balcony and give them darshan from the balcony. The throngs were elated, and uh, so were we. This was the first time that all the devotees from all over India came together. Prabhupada had arrived in Calcutta and other devotees had arrived in Bombay. And for a whole year, people were doing preaching at different places. Some devotees were preaching in Delhi, some, some devotees had gone down south. But at this time, Prabhupada was going to uh, reorganize all the preaching in India. So devotees came from uh, all over uh, different parts of India to be with Prabhupada at this specific time. So in the morning, Srila Prabhupada would go out and take his walk. And he wanted to have the kirtan party, you know, going on with him when he took his morning walk. And as we walked through the different camps, uh, sadhus would come out and uh, pay their you know, respects to Srila Prabhupada. Because Srila Prabhupada described this Magamela at the time, there were reported seven million saintly souls that went to take part in the festivities throughout the month. Never had, had we been in such crowds of people or lived amid so many people. Srila Prabhupada determined what our activities would be from morning till night at this pandal. So it was both for purification and for example of what Vaishnavas do. And while a program of deity worship went on with artis and offerings throughout the day, one of the main engagements of the day was prashad distribution. So virtually uh, people were cooking and distributing prashadam throughout the whole day. And different devotees volunteered for that uh, cooking service. Sagar Maharaj was instrumental in showing us how to shop in this environment. And Rabadi Nandan Maharaj was quite instrumental in the uh, making and distribution of both halawa and kitchri. I didn't get to go on a single one of those morning kirtans. I had to cook for 45 people breakfast on the fires. <laughs> then I had to cook lunch on those fires. Then one day Prabhupada said, after lunch was over, he said, I want you to prepare rice, puris and chutney for 700 people. And that was to be passed out in the pond all in the afternoon. And then after that, I had to get dinner ready for 45 people. <laughs> I had two little wood fire pits, and all we had was sticks. I mean, just sticks, not even chunks of wood that you could make a bed of coals out of, you know, just sticks. So all you had was flame and, and soot, you know. <laughs> the pots were covered with soot. I was covered with soot. Now somehow, I was putting out every bit I had 
to do that service at that time. It was the hardest thing I ever did materially. I mean, I was just following the crowd. Most of us were. And then we arrive in this place by foot, and it's just, you know, like all the bizarre things you'd ever thought about or heard about India were right there in front of your face and going on. You know, the, the naked Nagar Babas, Pete men riding on elephants, the, the snake charming Babas. <laughs> it was just all happening there. And every day, Prabhupada, would, as you can see, would take us out on Nagar Sankirtan. There's my daughter, Hari Bo. <laughs> This is a very ancient festival, Prabhupada told us. It goes back many, many thousands of years. At this time, that the, all the holy men, uh, they come and they gather because there's a very auspicious constellation. And if you take bath at that time, you're guaranteed liberation. And I remember asking Prabhupada whether that was really true. Prabhupada said, yes, it's true. He said, but we, don't, we didn't come here to be for that, because we're already liberated. We came here to preach Christian consciousness. But um, I did go for, you know, the <laughs> because I wanted the guarantee. <laughs> I went, and you have to go early in the morning, about 4 o'clock, and, and uh, there are no lights. It's very cold. The wind is blowing because it's winter time, And just hundreds of people are, are wandering towards the river. And it was a, a really sensational experience. Here you can see Srila Prabhupada sh shaving. There was no hot water available. Of course, perhaps someone heated a little water up for Prabhupada. But the amazing thing was that Prabhupada, at such an advanced age, uh, came to this place with, with so many devotees to live in a tent. Everyone was living in a tent. And it was wintertime. It's cold. Of course, during the day it warmed up a bit because of the sun. But um, it's also said that at a certain day uh, in the course of this festival, it rains. And sure enough, when that day came, it rained. And so it was really miserable after that because everything was damp and very difficult to keep warm. So here we see uh, Srila Prabhupada and the devotees getting ready to make a visit to the local Gaudiya Mutt. And... Uh, of course, Prabhupada lived in Allahabad for a number of years, and he had a business there. And uh, he told us also later that he donated the deities there. I remember what struck me when we went there that day was there was Prabhupada in the lead, and then there was eight or nine rickshaws following behind, again, like little ducklings. Wherever he went, we followed behind. That was our relationship. <laughs> Never, never knowing exactly the full significance of what, what Prabhupada was doing. But uh, as I said before, looking back now, it, it's clear to me that Prabhupada knew exactly. Uh, it was like a great campaign that he had planned and, and been carrying out. The Rupa Guru Math in Allahabad. This was a, a most exciting event for all of uh, Srila Prabhupada's Western disciples. Not only were we attending a program with Srila Prabhupada, but we were attending a program at a temple that he was very instrumental in serving in the years before he left India, when he lived in Allahabad. Oh, here's your, the deities. We were all aware of the fact that Srila Prabhupada had in his business years, arranged for the Archa Vigraha at this mandir, the Radha and Krishna deities. It was uh, his service. This is, in fact, one of the first Archa Vigraha that I ever saw a photo of in my entire life when we were in San Francisco in 1967. And some very early photos were sent from Calcutta, taken by Achyutananda and uh, Ramanuja Brahmachari, we had a photograph of these deities that were sent to us in San Francisco. And so it was one of the first Radha and Krishna deities that I ever saw from India. So they always remain very dear to me. Srila Prabhupada was very proud of the fact that of all these Pandals, 
at the Magmela that year. None attempted a deity worship program of Radha Krishna Archa Vigrahas but ours. So we became very famous for even that aspect of, of our presence. The Archa Vigraha was Sri Radha Madhava. Prabhupada, on another day, he took us all through, not all of us, but I know I was with him, and uh, we drove through the city, and he pointed out different places where he lived and where his business was and <clears throat> things like that. I remember one day Prabhupada told us that uh, many yogis come here, and some of them are very old, up to 300 years, and he said that... Uh, that they uh, appear just like young young boys, so you wouldn't recognize them. He said two came to see him, and they, they told him that they lived in the jungle with some tigers. <laughs> I remember being amazed because it was the first time Prabhupada spoke about um, some of the cities that the yogis there had. He said, he told us, you must be very careful because these are very powerful yogis here and that many of them have very powerful siddhis and they can go down in the Ganga at the Himalaya and come up here at Triveni. They have the siddhi to be able to move between places. He said, so you must be very respectful, very careful. During this time at the Kumbh Mela, uh, we were taken across the Ganga in boats, and we went to the ashram of Prabhudat Brahmachari. He was an old man, uh, and he was famous because he had done the translation of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, which was originally written in Bengali, and Prabhupada had translated into English, but Prabhudat had translated into Hindi. So most people in northern India speak Hindi, so they were able to appreciate the translation of Prabhudat. Uh, Allahabad is a, uh, figures as a very prominent place in uh, the Gaudiya Vaishnava's history because Rupa Goswami uh, was instructed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Allahabad, in Prayag, for so many days, I think 10 days, uh, when Rupa Goswami was on his way to Vrindavan to carry out his mission. And at this specific spot, Mahaprabhu instructed Rupa Goswami, and Rupa Goswami later on uh, wrote down all the Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy, which, which governs all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas to this very day. All his uh, writings, he was considered the most uh, prominent of the Goswamis, Rupa Goswami. But I was so sick that when I got up in the morning about 4 o'clock and had to run for the outhouse, there was somebody in the outhouse. And then I went back in and I climbed between the, 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 the quilts again to get warm. And I just laid there and I couldn't move. And then I heard the Mangala Arti start. <laughs> and I got up and I got dressed and I came into Arti and I must have been 10 minutes late. And Prabhupada walked, watched me walk in from the back. And he was talking about uh, the Bhagavatam story of Ajamil about the subject of atonement. The Sanskrit word is prayaschita, and it means atonement. And he was talking about how atoning for sins doesn't solve the problem because it doesn't cleanse the seed of sinful desire from the heart. And so even though you can get free from the reaction by atonement, by some kind of prayaschita, you can't stop the tendency to commit the sin again that way. And then he started talking about Ajamil and how Ajamil as a youth, and he said he did some very pure service. And Prabhupada was looking at me as he said it. And then he said, very pure. But then later in his life, because of circumstance, he fell down and he went to his death as a fallen worldly man. But it was right as I walked in and as he was looking at me that he talked about Ajamil doing some pure service in his youth. And then as he was looking at me, he said, very pure. Even now, thinking back on it and what happened and then how my life has gone since, it almost seemed like he saw my future. He 
Here we see uh, Vairagi Baba meeting Srila Prabhupada on the Harinam procession at Kumbha Mela. And he was a devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He had huge cartels that we call wampers. And he would chant Hari Bol, Hari Bol, and clash the wampers together. Uh, Srila Prabhupada had met Vairagi Baba earlier in Bombay at Prem Kutir. And then again, uh, Srila Prabhupada met him at the Gita Jayanti Samelan in Indore. And one evening, Vairagi Baba joined Srila Prabhupada and the devotees on the stage. And Srila Prabhupada got up off the Vyasasan and came right in front of Vairagi Baba and began to jump up and down and dance in an effort to encourage him also to jump up and down and dance. And there were the two of them jumping up and down and dancing before thousands of people. Then at the Kumbha Mela, Srila Prabhupada encouraged Vairagi Baba to join us. And some of the evenings at the Pandal program, Vairagi Baba would also come on stage and, and he would chant and dance with the devotees. And we could see that Srila Prabhupada really wanted to engage him. And he was very enthusiastic about Sankirtan and Mahaprabhu. And he was also uh, enlivened to be part of Srila Prabhupada's work. And there was a big hundi, and they, we'd empty the coins every day, and the next day we'd go on a walk. Prabhupada would have us give the coins to the leapers and other afflicted people. There was a whole colony of these people as part of the mela. They'd come to the mela to get the blessings and of the sadhus, and, you know, to get some paces they have to live. So one devotee said, one morning stopped, he said, well, wouldn't it be better if we gave them prasadam? Because we saw prasadam as a big plate of hollow and kitchery. Prabhupada stopped and turned, he said, for them, this is prasad. <laughs> I was in Banaras at that time when Srila Prabhupada was touring, traveling India with his 40 disciples. The, I read in a newspaper, in America, Krishna Bhakti is priest. Naturally, I was devotee of Krishna, so I liked this topic. So <clears throat> I went there. Then there was a procession from the Sasmed Ghat to Tapan Misra's house that is now in Banaras. When procession finished, I approached Susila Prabhupada and I spoke in Hindi. Bhagavan Ap Kab America Gaita. When you went to America and how you preach. <laughs> the Prabhupada said, You see. I just chant Hare Krishna and give some lecture. He said they need this Vedic knowledge. So just see how they are happy and they are chanting. Then I asked, where is your program after Banaras? The Prabhupada said, I will go to Gorakhpur. So I wrote down the date. Then I went to Gorakhpur and Prabhupada was there. He was staying in Krishna Niketan. I went there. I was waiting. And Prabhupada was at that time alone. So I did not recognize that he is Prabhupada. Where is uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami? I asked Prabhupada. <laughs> so Prabhupada asked me, why you want to meet with him? I replied, because he is my guru. I like him very much. The Prabhupada asked me, why you accept him as your guru? I said, because he is the servant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then Prabhupada asked me, who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? So I said, he is Krishna himself. 
So I was talking and Prabhupada asked, why you accept Lord Chaitanya as Krishna? So because I read Chaitanya Charitamrit, Krishna himself came as a devotee to preach. <laughs> then, then, then Prabhupada said, no, 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 he is not Krishna. He is devotee of Krishna. I said, no, he is Krishna himself. The Prabhupada said, insisted, no, he is devotee of Krishna. He is not Krishna. Then I, I spoke very hard words to Srila Prabhupada. I, I said, was chupra, he just keep quiet, don't speak anymore. <laughs> then Prabhupada laughed very loudly. <laughs> very loudly he was laughing. Laughing. Then some bhaktas came and they were offering obeisances. So I realized that he is Guru Maharaj, he is Sila Prabhupada. So when they offered obeisances, I also offered obeisances. And so I said, Please forgive me. I offended at your lotus feet. I did not recognize you. Please forgive me. Then Prabhupada caught my hand like this and come to my room. Then uh, three disciples were sitting there. Uh, Prabhupada was laughing, laughing. His smile was not uh, stopped. And then he told that he, he knows that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna himself. So he said, you chastised me, I like that. <laughs> I am very happy with your words. The biggest splash we made, of course, was the Cross Maidan Festival in March of 71. We brought Western-style advertising techniques to India for the first time and made huge um, advertising efforts with balloons. And I remember we had one skyscraper, seven-story building with Hare Krishna written down the side in giant letters. And we selected the park or the, the grounds right in the center of Bombay called Cross Maidan, where daily tens of thousands of people walked. And the whole idea was to introduce Hare Krishna movement to India. And daily, 50 to 100,000 people would attend morning and evening lectures, but all day long the, the pandal was kept open for, for people to walk around and ask devotees questions. There was a question and answer booth, the different displays of Krishna consciousness around the world. People began to get the idea that this was a global movement started by one of their own. I was... Uh especially attracted by their appeal that said, American sadhus are in town, European sadhus. I had only heard of Haridwar sadhus or Vrindavan Mathura sadhus or Pandharpur sadhus. So I was curious. That time I didn't get to uh, see Prabhupada or... Uh, I, I was mostly in uh, meeting devotees. Uh, but I was very much impressed with uh, Prabhupada's devotees, Prabhupada's followers. They were pretty dead serious, grave, convinced, uh, knowledgeable, and uh, you know, I had these impressions. And if this was his followers and disciples, then I could only you know, imagine the, their guru, their spiritual master must be... Uh, far, far superior. I had just come down from Himalayas and Varanasi and Bodh Gaya. And I was in Bombay. And I was walking down the road. I saw a big sign saying Hare Krishna Festival at Cross Maidan. It was on that first day of the Pandal program. Tens and thousands of people attended. And I was way, way back in the crowds, just watching. And Prabhupada came on stage. Madhubhisa Prabhu was leading kirtan. The bodies were dancing. And Guru Das Prabhu was taking photos. And I saw Guru Das called over by Prabhupada, and they were talking for some time. 
And then Guru Das was looking, looking, looking through the crowds for quite a while. And he came all the way to the back of the crowds and took me by the hand and said, Prabhupada wants you to sit with him on stage. And I asked, how does Prabhupada know who I am? And he didn't say anything. He just pulled me up. And when we came to the stage, Prabhupada smiled at me. And with his hand, he gestured that I should sit not far from his Vyasa-san. And I sat. And I saw Srila Prabhupada when he was speaking. He just had such a sincere longing to reach people's hearts. Such deep compassion, such deep concern. When he sat down to speak, I could barely understand his accent was so strong. But the purport was surrender. And <laughs> that came through. The idea of surrendering was a little overwhelming, but the thought was certainly there. I knew this was a pivotal moment. Meeting is divine grace. This marriage ceremony seemed to be a very, very proud event for Srila Prabhupada because it was really displaying the international influence of Krishna consciousness on a very solid basis of lifelong vows of dedication. While the marriage was taking place, suddenly I felt somebody holding onto my hand. I turned down and it was little Saraswati looked at me right in the face and said, guess what? I replied, what? And with a big smile on her face, she said, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then she ran away. And later on, during one of the lectures, Srila Prabhupada noted how this little Saraswati was a perfect preacher because whatever she knew about Krishna, she was eager to share that with others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 